Thanks for joining our talk how Mercedes-Benz is securing 900 Kubernetes clusters uh, without port security policies. My name is Tobias Giese. I'm a software engineer working for Mercedes-Benz Tech Innovation since 2017. I'm a certified Kubernetes security specialist, and I'm involved into Kubernetes since, I think, 1.7 or something. Um, I'm a former maintainer of the cluster API provider for OpenStack, and I really love hearing and collecting records, and I also love to optimize my home office desk setup. Yeah, my name is Tiag Rasche. I'm also working as a software engineer at Mercedes-Benz Tech Innovation. Uh, I've been working with Kubernetes since about version 1.13, I'm not really sure. I'm very active in the local Kubernetes community. For example, I'm the initiator of uh, the Kubernetes meetup in our beautiful Swabian hometown of Ulm. And <laughs> got a few Ulmers here. And also, I love making and teaching music, especially playing the drums. So uh, we work for a company called Mercedes-Benz Tech Innovation, uh, which is a 100% subsidiary and strategic partner for Mercedes-Benz. Uh, our company has been developing software for Mercedes-Benz since 25 years. Yeah, uh, we have around 1,400 employees who work in different business streams. They're called one customer, car, car sales, car after sales. And of course, from our point of view, the most important stream technologies in security, where few people provide cybersecurity services for all of Mercedes-Benz. And of course, we, the platform engineering guys, uh, provide cloud services and infrastructure for all of Mercedes-Benz. Uh, so our team runs the main managed Kubernetes platform for all of Mercedes-Benz. We run round about 1,000 Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we cannot say the exact number at the moment because it's a full self-service platform. So uh, every uh, engineering team at Mercedes-Benz could provision or deprovision a cluster at any time, but it's around 1,000. Uh, they run in eight different zones, so uh, data centers, which are located in two geographic regions, one in Germany, one in the US. And uh, they run on-premises and in the public cloud. We provide both. So uh, before we can go into the deep details and how we work in our security setup, uh, we ha first have to explain what managed Kubernetes actually means at Mercedes-Benz. Um, so, our engineering teams don't have to think about Kubernetes operations at all. That means they don't have any access to the nodes, so no SSHing into the nodes, but also they don't have to think about stuff like what operating system is the node running, what's the network infrastructure looking like, stuff like that. They don't have to think about that at all. A second, maybe even more important aspect, is that we have very strict security lockdowns on all of our clusters um, to so our customers have to think less about Kubernetes operations. Uh, for example, no engineering team can start root containers on our platform. They're not allowed to um, mount host path volumes. And also, which is a bit more tricky to implement, we totally block system namespaces. So for example, uh, no engineering team but us can access any resources or change or edit them within Kube system, for example. Yeah, and how we actually did or implemented that before our upgrade to validating revision policies is Toby's time now. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so let's talk about a bit about the status quo of Kubernetes 124, which was one year ago in our case. So we used PSPs, or pod security policies, to enforce uh, the pod security in our Kubernetes clusters. Also, we're using Open Policy Agent. This is running as a static pod manifest because we have to um, run this completely independent because we add this pod or this container as a Kube API server parameter because we are using the authorization webhook. Um, also, we are handling validating webhooks and, like I said, the authorization webhook. Let's take a deeper look into the authorization webhook or more like the Kube flow of an API server request. So here you can see the complete workflow. A user creates a YAML or a GET request. Um, and first, the authentication and authorization webhook will come in place. So here we can handle, for example, um, the deny of a impersonate, or we also deny the deletion of nodes, and so on. Next step is the mutating ambition controller. Here we can default sing things or update things. And next step is the object scheme validation. This must be after the mutation, because we want to check if the, or Kubernetes checks if the scheme is valid. Um, and last but not least, the validating admission controllers webhook. So here we can validate if the manifest is valid or not, if we wanted to allow it or deny. Um, 
I will talk about this later, but we, we are using validating emission policies, and this is the same step here. Last but not least, it will be stored in the ad CD, and it's done. Okay, so let's give you a quick overview about the complete journey of our replacement of port security policies. First, like I already said, we are using port security policies. And the next step, we try to use Kiverno or Gatekeeper and other policy engines, but uh, this was not really feasible because we had performance issues. We, have, uh, we had benchmarking, we will see this later, and we had request responses up to 11 seconds, and this is completely no-go. Last but not least, the validating emission policies started to evolve with K Kubernetes 126, and this is where we are now. Okay, so, Chuck. Um, yes, sorry. You maybe noticed there's one thing missing on, on the slides, and it's the pod security standards. So why don't we notice this here? Yeah, for those of you uh, exactly following the development of policy enforcement and, and pod security in Kubernetes, you may ask yourself, wait, uh, pod security policies were removed after 124, but they added pod security admission and the, the feature of pod security standards. Um, and to be totally clear, pod security standards are a really great and well thought out feature. Um, it's basically just you can categorize a pod and map it to one of uh, the available security standards, and then Kubernetes will automatically uh, enforce very same default security uh, practices on that pod. Uh, so that is pretty great because you don't have to think about that at all. People who really know their stuff, the core maintainers, will always uh, update the pod security standards. So no matter what API <laughs> changes or future changes happen in Kubernetes, the standard will always be up to date and you don't really have to think about pod security at all. And while this opinionated matter is very good for that reason, it's also bad for us for the same reason because it is very opinionated. And it gets in the very low details, but uh, for example, we have down on a capability level things we want to allow which pod security standards would uh, block. Uh, a very concrete example for that is uh, the net admin capability. If you want to know more about that, uh, my colleagues Toby and Mario, he's somewhere in the audience, uh, once wrote an article why I want to allow that on Medium. And we also have a few syscuddles we want to allow and stuff like that, so we're very detailed. Uh, so let's real quick. Uh, talk about what we actually would need from a custom policy solution. Uh, first of all, and I think already quite well explained, is we need a very flexible way to define policies for pods, but also it would be cool if we could uh, define policies for other resources as well, for deployments, cron jobs, stuff like that, but that's a pure user experience issue. Another thing that's very important for us is a thing we call cluster pollution. Uh, so we uh, we're a very large organization. There are several thousand engineers uh, working with our Kubernetes clusters. Um, so there are several thousand opinions on which tools are the best to use and stuff like that. Um, and we want to enable customers to use the tools they want. And so if we would implement our custom policy solution with tools needing, for example, uh, custom resources, other cluster scope resources, uh, we would hinder the user or the consumer of our clusters, the engineering teams, from using the same tool. So we'd really like to keep out of uh, the customer space there. And last but not at all least, it's very important for us, but actually for everyone who wants to really run secure pods uh, enforced, to also be able to mutate resources. Uh, <laughs> that sounds a bit weird at first, but the only reason why we need that is because Kubernetes tends to have quite insecure defaults for some details in, uh, in pod security. Uh, for example, most of you will probably know the flag uh, allow privilege escalation on a pod. If that is not set, the Kubernetes core will actually de default the flag on a Linux level, new new privileges to false. So, but we would want that to be true, to be secure by default. Well, that's a very concrete example of stuff we, uh, why we want to mutate if people don't, um, don't set flags like that at all, which most users don't do, because probably most users who just want to write a deployment don't think about that stuff at all, which is good. That's why we are here, the platform team. Okay, cool. So uh, now let's take a look at the main open source tools, the players in that field, which we could use, which we looked at. Um, <clears throat> the two big players in that space are Open Policy Agent and, um, Agent and Kiverno. 
And we already use Open Policy Agent uh, as a static pod on every node, as Toby already explained. So that seemed like the pretty logical choice for us. Mm. But a very big drawback of uh, Open Policy Agent is that it's very, very complex to implement policies with it. Um, it comes with its own Turing complete full-blown programming language just for policies called Rego. And we're quite a small team. We're only six people running the clusters themselves. And so we would really like to introduce as little new technology or technology we're not very familiar with uh, as possible. Also, when used in the way we already did it, uh, Open Policy Agent is not really Kubernetes native because if we wanted to change policies, we would have to change them on the node somewhere and we cannot do it via the API server. Uh, you can use Open Policy Agent or the same policy agent uh, with Gatekeeper. Then it is Kubernetes native. You can manage all policies uh, with the API server. But in that case, uh, it pollutes the customer, uh, the customer cluster, as I explained earlier. Yeah. The second really big player is uh, Kyverno. Um, it also checks almost all the boxes. You can mutate, you can write policies, and you can write them in a very kubernetes -y way, is what I'd say. Like Everyone who is very experienced writing Kubernetes uh, manifests will be able to write a um, Kyverno policy in uh, quite a short amount of time. Um, it is Kubernetes native. All policies can be managed via custom resources and via the API server. But it does uh, need, obviously, custom resource definitions, so it would hinder users uh, from using Caverna themselves. But uh, that whole pollution thing, it's not a hill we're willing to die on. It's just something that we really strive for. So uh, we've settled actually on Caverna uh, in our first iteration. So let's talk about what was our experience like with policy enforcement in Caverna. Uh, it was actually a pretty great user experience. Uh, we were able to really achieve a great readability and a great maintainability. It really just reads like normal Kubernetes manifests all of us know and work with daily. And we actually had all our policies, which is a quite a large stack and quite complex, uh, implemented in a few days. And we had to work a bit on our end-to-end -end tests because they were quite pod security policy specific. But we had them passing a few days later as well. And at that time, we thought, oh, cool. Goal is reached. Uh, we're ready to go. Let's go into uh, canary deployment. Toby, what happened then? Yeah, thanks, Doug. So, the first day of our canary deployments were like this, this little fellow's looking like, and not really cool. It was pretty disappointing. So, for example, we have a canary cluster customer that is using a development cluster, and he is deploying a lot of controllers and operators into it. And these controllers are updating the pods every 10 seconds. So, they update the annotations and labels, and because of this, and also because of a failure of us, um, Kiverno also enforced or mutated things during a pod update. Uh, this is not necessary because everything is, um, is, is not able to change. It's uh, immutable, besides for the image. But um, yeah, this was a failure by us. But we had to benchmark the Kiverno controller somehow. So we have to stress test it, and we have to take care of this. So we started benchmarking. So how, we did, how did we did this? We are using K6 from Grafana Labs. And to be compatible to a real cluster, we used kind and add a max quota of two CPUs to, to this, because our smallest control plane nodes have also two, two CPUs. And in this case, we are some kind of equivalent. Um, we used 100 virtual users as a parameter for K6, and also 1,000 iterations. This means that during the stress testing, we, we are doing 100,000 API requests to the Cube API server. Um, to do an API request, we use a simple pod manifest, which is a valid manifest without any specifications, just an image, name, security context, and that's it. And also, we, we, we use the dry run for this. OK, so let's take a look at the benchmarks. Yeah, and this is pretty awful. So pod security policies response during the stress load with a maximum response time of 0.4 seconds, and Kiverno is at 11 to 12 seconds. Um, the me medium response time is at four seconds, and the minimal response time is longer than the maximum response time from port security policies. This is not really feasible for our fleet, because if you take green IT principles in mind, this scales nowhere. So we have to take a look at um, of, of alternatives. So, we went back to the drawing board and created a battle plan. 
So we, we, we had three little teams, and each team is doing their own things. So we had one team for the open policy agent implementation. So we, we have it already implemented. There's an existing setup. But someone has to write the policies for it to replace the port security policies. Next, we had a team that is um, there to, use a, to write a custom controller. So we can do this because we have enough knowledge to create controllers. We're using Cube Builder for this, and it's pretty easy to do this. So this team is, is creating the custom controller. Then also another team is uh, improving our benchmarking suite. For this talk, we used this improved benchmarking suite, but we had to implement this somehow. OK, so uh, while this is a really good plan, but um, we are running out of time because we are currently want to update from 124 to 125, but 126 is already around the corner. So we have to think about this as well because we don't want to tail behind too far. OK, so um, we created a plan for this as well. So we can easily update our control plans from 124 to 125. And if this is done, we can update the control plans to 126. And regarding the Kubernetes school policy, we are then able to update all of our worker nodes to 126 in one update step. So, so this is pretty cool. Um, during, during, uh, during reading the release notes of 126, we then found, in our case, the holy grail. Because validating emission policy started to uh, evolve in Kubernetes with 126. And we can use this alpha feature easily because we have a really good end-to-end -end test, um, test suite. And we can test this and add this also to production. OK, cool. But what are validating emission policies? Um, validating emission policies allows us to add custom admission logic. Um, and we can do this and, and create this to, to customize it to our needs as well. OK. And also, it is lightning or pretty fast, thanks to in-memory abstract syntax tree. And also, like Chuck uh, no, uh, talked to, uh, said it before, there's no additional control and also no CRD needed because we don't want to pollute our customer clusters. OK, cool. Um, that is really high level, but what is a validating emission policy in Technic? Yeah, uh, so let's just build some validating emission policies, right? Uh, by the way, the image you can see, that's how my grandmother imagines my job. I mean, I'm an engineer at Mercedes, right? <laughs> OK, so let's talk about validating emission policies. Um, very basic, what we want to do is uh, we have an input, the admission request, we want to do some custom logic, and then we want to arrive at a policy decision. A cool feature which uh, validate emission policies actually support, but which is optional, is we can also define a um, custom resource as input as well for validating emission policies, so we can inject uh, custom configuration values. Um, yeah, the admission request, I guess, is pretty clear. It comes from the API server. It just contains what the user actually wants to do. Uh, Let's look, take a look at uh, an example validating emission policy to see how we can configure uh, the custom resource as input. Uh, so this is a very, very basic uh, validating emission policy. And if you have a detailed look, you can see the paramkide uh, property. And it's just a custom resource reference in there. Our custom resource is called admission exception. Um, we have lots of custom controllers running as well in all of our clusters because we have like cool cluster add-ons. It's basically my main job to develop them for our users. And some, sometimes uh, these <coughs> sometimes these controllers want to do things which would actually be not allowed in our policies. So it's cool for us to have the ability per, per cluster to uh, manage a list of admission exceptions, of exceptions to our admission controllers. So in our case, the custom resource is just simply a list of service accounts and their namespace. Yeah, but if we have that configured, we also need a way to tell Kubernetes which custom resource to use as input for the validating emission policy. For that, uh, Kubernetes also introduced a new resource called validating emission policy binding. And it's very similar to other resource binding types of Kubernetes. Like, you probably know cluster role binding or role binding, very similar stuff. You have a param ref, which just references the uh, custom parameter, in our case, the admission, admission exception custom resource uh, by name. And also, you have the policy name, which references the uh, regarding policy by name. OK, so we have both our inputs done. Now we need to implement the custom logic. 
uh, yeah, we can <clears throat> take another look at our custom, uh, at our validate emission policy here, and see the validations field down there. Uh, in this case, we only have one expression, but you could actually add as many as you like, but for the simplicity of this talk, we only add one. Um, and you can actually see there's a very simple expression written down there in the expression, and that's in a new language introduced by Google, which is called Common Expression Language, or short, Cell. Uh, what is Cell? Cell was developed by Google explicitly to be used in uh, critical code paths. So it is evaluated, guaranteed to be evaluated in linear time, uh, that's possible because it is mutation-free and not Turing complete, uh, very computer science -y terms. It uh, basically just means you cannot do stuff like for loops, you cannot mutate any variables, stuff like that. Um, what it means for us is uh, that it's very fast, and that's very good, and it's guaranteed to be very fast. Yeah, and if we take a, a very simple example like this one, I think probably most, if not everybody in this room can already get what it's doing because it's just some expression, like it's very similar to other languages. We take uh, the object which references the input from the admission, uh, the admission request itself and check if the service account name referenced, in this case it would be a deployment, is in the list of excluded service accounts. So the params is basically referencing the custom input from the CRD. Uh, yeah, this looks uh, cool and very fine, but uh, I have to warn you if you want to write uh, co complex, <coughs> complex validation with cell, uh, this is a more realistic example of how policies look. Um, yeah, quite an unreadable mess. But we can look at a few details which are actually great examples for downsides of, of uh, validating emission policies as well. So if you look at that part, uh, you can see that we have to repeat ourselves a lot because we want it to be like the user experience to also not only validate the pods for security reasons, but also to not allow deployments if they have forbidden pods in them, for example. So we have to write stuff like this, lists of resources we want to check, stuff like that. And another way more important, because security critical detail, you have to think a lot about the details of sub-resources in pods. There was in 125 a feature introduced called ephemeral containers. Those are containers running on your node. If you forget to enforce policies on them, you could just don't use policies at all. There is also quite new in uh, the newer versions of Kubernetes now, sidecar containers natively supported. And if you're writing in cell, you have to write that, uh, that out all one after another. So the gist of it is, we, we started writing this stuff manually, but <laughs> I quickly realized that it's not fun at all. It's also very error prone. Uh, we realized that because we thought we're done, but our end-to-end -end tests were still failing. Um, so uh, you will need, if you want to build something like that, something to generate your code. In our case, it was just a quite simple Helm setup because uh, all we basically have to do is repeat the policy we want to enforce for ephemeral containers and stuff like that. But this is very highly dependent on the policies you would want to enforce. Yeah. Um, so we've got our custom logic implemented as well in cell with some code generation and now we're done, it seems like it, right? <laughs> we thought that uh, before, but now we're done, right? But there is a detail missing, like what about Toby, can you tell us more? <laughs> yeah, thanks, of course. Um, so we also have to think about the mutation. Oh, no, it's working here. Uh, we have to think about the mutation of, of pod resources. So the validation is working, but what is with the mutation? There's the same feature like the validating emission policies coming in Kubernetes 131, hopefully. Um, called mutating emission policies, but this is not available currently, so we have to think about something different. So if we go back to the drawing board, we can see, okay, there was a team building the custom controller. Okay, this is pretty cool because we can remove the validation part, but only use the mutation part. So we have to mutate the allowed privilege escalation to false and run as non root to true, that's, that's it. Okay, cool, now um, after this in mind, we can say we have a final setup that is pretty cool. We have validating, uh, validation in lightning speed via validating emission policies, and we have the mutation over this, this tiny con custom controller, which is really, really tiny, and that's it. So is it really faster than, than Kiverno? Yeah, I think it is. Okay, so um, our max response time is at 1.2 seconds, and the average response time is at point four or 0.37. In comparison to Kiverno, it is really much faster. Cool. Um, so we are done, right? Yeah, um, I don't think so. By the way, this is my cat Clyde. 
<laughs> it's a real photo. He's also a Kubernetes engineer. He committed a file once in our uh, repository, but this is another, another story. <laughs> okay, so, um, but why does he have this skeptical stare? So we have Kubernetes, uh, we have the validating mission policies in 126 and port security policies in 124, but what is with 125? We don't have anything here. So let's get, let's get back a last one, uh, one more time to the drawing board and take a look here. So we had there also a team implementing the open policy agent policies. So we can use this for 125 with the admission controller and we can use the validating admission policies with the admission controller for 126. That's perfect, so we are ready to go. Okay, cool. Um, by the way, our future plans are using validating and mutating admission controllers, uh, policies to remove the HTTP overhead and have everything built in, in into Kubernetes. That's very cool. Okay, then let's take a look at the final benchmark comparison. So we have here, this is our validating admission policies. We have PSP underneath, and we can see it is even faster than Gatekeeper or Open Policy Agent, and it is much more faster than Kiverno, which is really good in our case. That is really cool. So, but let's take a look back what happened since then. So we have implemented this the, last, uh, the first two quarters of 2023, but Kiverno improved the performance by far. Uh, especially thanks to our colleague Robin Afflerbach because he has contributed the benchmarking of K6 to Kiverno and they were able to test this with their implementations and they saw that there was really a, a downside. So they improved it by far and just to notice this, Kiverno also can generate validating emission policies now so you can add cell, also common expression language to the uh, Kiverno cluster policies and it will create the validating emission policies for us. And also we have reporting for this. This is quite cool. So let's take a look at the Kaivano 112 benchmarking. Yeah, it is really, really better now. So we have an average response time of only 1.2 seconds and the minimum response time at one, uh, 0.1, which is really great and also only possibly because our colleague has in, uh, contributed everything to the Kaivano team. Cool, uh, but last but not least, we have, I think, a few lessons learned, and Tiak will talk about it. Yeah, <laughs> what have we learned? Uh, first of all, benchmark your policies. Uh, we mean it really, benchmark your policies. Uh, we would have saved a lot of work if we would have thought of this from the beginning. Yeah, and another very important uh, thing that we noticed or learned doing this is that good and really tool-independent end-to-end tests are crucial if you want to iterate really quick and if you want to build fast but also fail fast. I mean, basically, we had implemented the same thing three times. You could argue even four times, but it wasn't that huge of a... Uh, that much of a time invest we did because we could, also we could always just build it run the end-to-end -end test. If it's not read, it's wrong. But we were very confident if we uh, had all of our policy needs um, filled up with uh, the code we de uh, developed. Another very important thing, if you build your own policy solution, but th this is no matter how you do it, you will have to take care of the nitty-gritty details of sub-resources on pods. And you will also have to take care that if new features will be added, you think about that. So you have to very closely monitor everything that's happening in Kubernetes development. I talked about ephemeral containers and cycle containers before. That's the stuff. Maybe there will be new sub-resources added in the future. You would have to uh, think about that. So yeah, in the end, you can say uh, we paid a price for early adoption. We really did. Uh, but we really don't mind that. I mean, we're called Mercedes-Benz Tech Innovation, not Tech Trail Behind or something. Um, yeah, and the most important learning is that a pure Kubernetes solution is not only feasible and possible, but it's also quite maintainable. Uh, we have just basically just a hump chart rendering a few uh, policies. I mean, I guess everyone in this room has done that before. It's not, it's no rocket science, it's just Kubernetes. And so we're actually really, really happy with our final solution, and we will even be more happier if we can replace that tiny controller still running with mutating admission policies, and then we're completely doing all of our validation and mutation within the API server with no HTTP at overhead or anything at all. And that's already it. Thank you very much for listening to our talk. Uh, if you have... 
if you, if you have if you have any questions, don't hesitate at all to ask them, but please use the two mics uh, which are provided so uh, the people watching digitally can also hear that. And I have to say this, it's very important, <laughs> we're hiring, and if you're interested in working with us, there's a QR code, you can scan it, and I'd love to become colleagues with uh, probably not all of you, but maybe. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm not. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not very, really familiar with the validating admission policies feature inside of Kubernetes. Um, but as far as I understand, like you can only validate stuff that's in the the spec of that resource that's being admitted, right? Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So you might be familiar, but in Gatekeeper, there's a feature called external data provider. So it allows you to basically hand off um, some validation that can explore some external data that's not in the, in the Kubernetes resource. Yeah. Um, do you have any use cases um, like that where you want to validate something, maybe something to do with the image itself that you need to pass that off to something else? And uh, yeah, do you think that there's any shortcomings in terms of validating emission policies related to that kind of thing? There are definitely shortcomings in validating emission policies regarding that, but I wouldn't really call it a shortcoming because these are running in memory within the API server, so they're very focused on critical cold path performance. So stuff like that would never be possible and also will never be possible. But um, complex validation like that, you, you, like we do stuff like that for a lot of things, but that's nothing that would happen all the time just because someone is uh, changing resources on your API server. Uh, regularly, so you could do that with the traditional way of um, mute, uh, admission webhooks and stuff, custom controllers, how you'd like. But you probably would not want to have that for every single request reaching the API server, because like, if you run stuff like Argo CD or we have teams running very custom controllers, they tend to update resources every few seconds, and then you get the problems of huge overhead. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was uh, really interesting. I have a question regarding Kiverno uh, slowness. Uh, so what it um, based on your setup and what load on your kind of cluster you have and complexity of the policies or the framework in general was slow and doesn't matter what kind of policy you use or how, uh, load you generate on your cluster? I think I think it's a mix of, of different things. So. Um, Chuck is going back to the <laughs> a lot of slides. So um, basically, we only use a kind cluster to reproduce our problem with the high load. So this is uh, exactly the slide you, I think this answers everything because we just added a kind cluster without anything in it, but we added our complexity, our policies to it, yeah, for sure. Um, but I also think that Caverno is lacking of, of, of performance even with a single policy. We haven't tested this, so because we implemented everything that we have done with, with PSPs, so um, maybe this is something we can try. I mean, our policies are quite complex, but the important thing is that these comparisons, we implemented the exact same rule set of yeah. policies, so it is comparable. It, it's very possible that uh, if you have a less complex set of policies, Kyverno is totally fine with that, but we have a very, it's not like it's not rocket science, but we have quite detailed and complex policies. And the important thing is the compar comparability, and we implemented the exact same rule set on all of them. We, we guarantee that uh, thanks to our cool end-to-end -end tests, yeah. We also tested to remove some special policies from the um, Kyverno setup, but it doesn't improve anything there, so it's still slow. It was still slow. <laughs> cool, thank you. Yeah, thanks as well for the nice talk. Uh, I know the pain of getting rid of PSPs, and uh, yes, in the end, we adopted Kiverno. Um, what I'm really curious about is uh, how does your end-to-end -end test up look? Uh, could you outline that maybe in a few sentences? Do you want to? Or, I or can. I? Um, mm, how does it look like? So basically, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> So basically, we are using the Ginkgo framework to use end-to-end -end testing, and we are just testing the pod creation of different things, like we add a root container to it, 
we test that the mutation is working, we, we test the volumes and so on. So it's, it's just a simple pod creation and that's it. So we are not testing, we are not end-to-end -end testing the deployment demo set validation so because pod is totally fine. So oh. basically the setup is specific to the policies. Those end-to-end -end tests yeah. are specific for we, we, uh, testing the policies and not like... Ba ba basically uh, we have a set of rules we want to enforce and we mm. have a, a t test coverage for every rule we want to enforce, but that test coverage is not dependent on some error message b by some tool or something. It just checks if it get, gets submitted or not. Okay, thanks. Yep. Hey, thank you so much for your presentation. That was uh, amazing. I have just uh, a quick question about uh, policy uh, exception. I'm very curious to know how you manage that because I think in this case with close to 900 cluster, I'm sure you, you need to, to have exception. Yeah. And sometimes that you need to have maybe some temporary exception and some permanent exception. Um, and I'm very curious to know how you manage that here. And thanks again. Yeah, uh, there's two ways in which we use uh, the policy, uh, the admission exceptions in our case. Um, we have controllers uh, reconciling stuff, like we have custom add-ons for Clusters. You can, for example, deploy Istio with a single CRD and Datadog, stuff like that. And these controllers, sometimes, if they need to add privileges to some specific stuff, are able to um, manipulate these CRD, uh, CRs who are deployed in every cluster anyway automatically. And the second use case is when we have customers who we, where we can trust that they know what they're doing or have very specific needs, we can also edit this manually and we have tooling that we call it Snowflakes that those are applied automatically on upgrades and stuff as well. This can happen, but we never allow the customer to, to use root containers or something. No, of but course not, but <laughs> yeah, we have very okay, lot. But yeah, thank you so much for your answer. Perfect. Okay, so yeah. On our side, we are also using Kiverno, and then I would like to ask, for example, you know, with Kiverno, we can also do some kind of, you know, image validation, right? So then, for example, you can restrict to certain registry, and then, you know, even to certain version of some uh, images. Is it still possible with this uh, new? Sure, of course. You can validate everything which is inside the spec of a pod, and you can validate if it, the registry starts with a certain string okay. and yeah, we can do this as well, mm -hmm. of course. And then with, with Kiverno it's also possible whenever you create like a policy exception to actually say that you know you want to keep it alive only for, I don't know, X amount of time, you know? So it's... Yeah. That, that's not directly possible. I mean, you could probably create like a scheduled job or something for that so time, but... We don't want to say that Kiverno is bad. It's, no. it's just, it just doesn't fit to our needs. Yeah, no, sure, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kiverno is a really good user experience. I, that's basically the, the trade-off, right? No, that yeah. stuff like that is not possible. It also will not be possible because, like, we're talking about very core API server features here, so they're not going to build some scheduled thing in there or something. Okay, good. Hello, uh, thanks for the talk. I was just uh, wondering if any of the policies or maybe the, the Helm chart you used to render all the sub-policies for the sub-resources is this uh, open source somewhere or just internal? No, we're not allowed to open source that, we asked. But, may, but maybe we, we, we can do another round, so maybe that's feasible somehow. If you need it, maybe we can do it open source, but currently it's not possible. Okay, thank you. Yep. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for coming to the talk.